Hello and welcome to EE254. I'm your instructor, Gregory Myers. In this video, we're going to take a look at vectors and particularly we're going to focus on the creation of vectors and a subset of functions that we will find useful. The most important thing though that you want to do with these examples is practice, of course, but secondly, you want to start looking at some of the patterns in the MATLAB functions. This is something that you may not have noticed in the past, but essentially what you'll discover is that MATLAB is very systematic in how some of its functions behave. And to emphasize that, we're going to focus on the random number generation. This is something that we will be um, using quite a bit in this course, uh, not just simply the random number generators, but also then some of these other functions to create vectors and arrays. The first thing to note is what is a vector? Well, a to understand what a vector is, you first have to take a step back and remember what a scalar is or a single value. And so a single value then is viewed as a one by one or a scalar value, whereas a vector can be a row or column of data. Now, this is not the same as what you would have encountered in your physics class, although you could use MATLAB vectors to display or to use uh, treated as physics vectors. Instead, what you want to do is you want to think very much in terms of data. So a vector can simply be a one by n collection of values. But the most important thing to note is that they must be of the same data type. <clears throat> so you can have, for instance, a one by n vector of integers of u int 8, u int 16, u int 32, and so on. Or what you can see is you can also have an m by one collection of values. Once again, of the same data type. That's the only stipulation in MATLAB. We will see that there is a way to collect different data types into one array, but we will not be using that very much in this class. Uh, in addition, it is worth noting, and you'll discover this as we go along, further along is that there is really not that big of a distinction between scalar values, vectors, and arrays. Oftentimes the emphasis is perhaps a little too much on the differences and less on the similarities. So we're going to try to, after these couple of videos, to focus on the similarities. So how do you go about creating a vector? Well, one way to do so is just simply to do it manually. Um, this is rather painful, as you will see, and I'm going to limit our examples to just a few values for the manual creation. Now, <clears throat> the first thing to note before I get started here is I'm going to be using absolutely terrible, terrible variable names. And that's okay for this example, because the point is that we just want to run through a bunch of different ways to create the vectors. I do encourage you to use better variables, though, in the future. And so to begin with, with the manual creation, you can just simply start by saying A, pick a variable name, A, and then using a set of square brackets, we simply start with a value and then subsequent values spaced out. So in other words, if we want to have a vector of values from 0 to 9, we would simply say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And I think you can quickly see why this is going to be a painful way to go about doing it. Um, likewise, we can also create a, a column vector. Um, this first one right here is going to be a row vector, and the second one will be a column vector. We'll see the difference in just a second. But I do that by simply replacing the space or augmenting the space, if you would, with a semicolon. So it's going to be 0 colon, 1 colon, 2 colon, 3 colon, 4 colon, 5 colon. And once again, you can quickly see where this is a very painful approach. But let's take a second now to highlight both of these lines and right click and evaluate selection. The first thing that you should note is that now in my workspace, I have a couple of variables. 
And you can see right off the bat that the data type is a double, despite the fact that I have integers. So the first thing that you should note is the default numeric data type in MATLAB is double. The second thing you should notice is going to be the size. And that's very important that if you have not yet done so, to right click on your column headers and make sure that you include the value, the size, and the class. Um, in this case, you'll notice that A is in fact a one by 10 vector of doubles. So one by 10 vector of doubles. <clears throat> and this simply means that it's one row and 10 columns. Likewise, B is going to be a 10 by one vector of doubles with 10 rows and one column. And if you don't like necessarily the way the workspace has it laid out, you can of course just double click on it and you can see the values in the variable editor. So there is A and there is B. And if you needed a third way to do it, you can simply come over here to the command window and type in the variable name without a semicolon and you'll see there is your value there are your values for a and there are your values for b so it's important to notice that with a vector you are interested in not only the name of the vector and the data type of the vector but also multiple values which means that there is now a third piece of information that is relevant and that is the index or the location within the vector. Now we'll talk about that in our next video, uh, but just keep in mind now that I have to keep track of not only the variable name and the data type and multiple values, but I also am interested in the index or the location of the value. Another way to create a vector is to use the colon notation. Um, and basically there's a couple of ways to go about doing that. And once again, we'll start off with our value of zero. We will increment by one and we will stop at nine. And so what this does right here is this follows the pattern of start. I use my square brackets here, start colon increment colon end. Now, there is no reason that you cannot have a vector that has a end value that is lower or less than your start value, in which case you simply specify a decrement. So a good example of that would be to start at nine, counting backwards by negative one and going to zero. In both cases, C and D are going to result in one by 10 vectors of values and specifically doubles. So both of these will be one by 10. The other thing to note is that you are not limited by whole numbers. And so we can find ourselves very quickly using pi for instance, and a good example of that might be to have a vector E that is going to start off at two pi, and I'm going to go ahead and use the parentheses uh, in uh, with pi because pi can be treated as a function in MATLAB. And we start off with negative two pi rather, and let's say that we want to increment by pi divided by 64, and then we want to stop then at two times pi. So at this point then, what we've done is we've created a vector of doubles and I'm intentionally avoiding the semicolon so you can see all of them. All right, so let's see here. Let's make sure that I seem to have a typo here. Where did, ah, yes, there we go. I have my typo here. I like to use an abundance of parentheses. And in this case, I used an extra set of parentheses around my pi divided by 64. Um, but you'll see here that I actually get a one by 257 vector of doubles. And 
we are once again not limited in how we go about creating a, a vector. So we could, for instance, say 0, colon, 0 0.01, colon 1. And this is going to result in a 1 by 101 vector of values going from 0 up to 1 increment, incrementing by 0 0.01. So once again, several different ways to go about creating a a vector, so 1 by 101 vector of doubles. Now, before we go too much further, I would like to take just a second to show you a function in MATLAB that allows for you to transform a vector, a row vector, into a column vector, and a column vector into a row vector, and that is simply the single tick mark or single quote. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to make a new vector out of my vector f and I'm going to transform it from a row into a column. So this transforms from a row to a column and I guess hopefully this makes sense to you. Basically it goes both ways. So in this case what we'll see here is that our vector f is a 1 by 101, where our vector g is 101 by 1. They technically have the same values in them. They're just oriented differently. Now, so far we've seen manual creation. We've seen colon notation, both of which are very useful, particularly the colon notation. But what if, for instance, you don't necessarily know what the increment is or you don't want to bother calculating it? Instead, what you want to do is you want to use a function like linspace to create a linear, linear distribution of values. And so if you pull up the help for linspace, you'll see that there are two overloads we are going to focus on the second overload that allows for you to specify not only the starting value and the ending value, but the number of data points. And this is a very important discussion to have early on because we will use this quite often. The example that I give people is how many tick marks are on a 12 inch ruler. And after a little bit of thought, almost universally, I get the answer 12. Well, that is technically wrong. There are, in fact, 13-inch tick marks on a 12-inch ruler. The zeroth inch, or the left side of the ruler, if you're holding it in your hand, followed by 12 additional tick marks for numbers 1 through 12 for a total of 13 tick marks. Now, sometimes in the case of the ruler, you will know up front how, what the increment is. So if I were to model the ruler here, let's take a second and we'll specify an H here and we'll simply say 0 colon 1 colon 12, which essentially is a ruler. Well, <clears throat> Linspace. Linspace does this a little differently. It says that well, you may, while you may be able to calculate the interval, we're not really interested in knowing what it is. Rather, we just simply want to specify the number of data points. And so let me give you an example of this here. So example, what if I wanted to have values from 0 to pi? And specifically, I wanted 100 of them. Well, yes, we could come up with a formula to be able to determine the interval. It would, however, be much simpler to just simply say i, and this, I'm running out of letters here already, um, i is equal to linspace from 0 to pi, and specifically, I want 100 of them. <clears throat> if we run this one right here, you'll see that this results in a 1 by 100 vector. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a second, I'm going to clear my workspace, and we're going to focus just on our i. You'll see there is a 1 by 100 vector. And the numbers really don't look like something we would recognize. 
the instead we probably wanted to actually have 101 data points and if we change this you'll see that now we get essentially an interval of 0 0.0314 once again we could have done this with the colon notation but sometimes it's just more convenient to use lens space and likewise in certain cases it's more convenient to use the colon notation. Now the first overload of lens space just simply specifies a hundred for n whereas in the overload you can control how many data points you have and you can see here that they actually emphasize then the relationship between the two. We'll actually be using this relationship quite often. So continuing on, let's take a look at some other functions that will allow for us to create both vectors and arrays, um, specifically the zeros function. And the zeros function, as you would imagine, simply just creates an array of all zeros. Now, this is probably a great way to go ahead and start talking a little bit about arrays in that arrays just simply mean that you have multiple dimensions. So for instance, where in a vector you may have a 1 by n or an m by 1, in an array you may have 2, 3, or more dimensions that are all greater than 1. So let's see how this works. So we'll start off, I think we're up to the letter j now, and we will simply use the zeros function to create a 1 by 10 vector of zeros. And so I'm going to go ahead and run this so we can see it in the command line. Probably not the most interesting thing you've ever seen. Uh, we will take just a second to point out this is a 1 by 10 vector of doubles. And specifically, it is 0. But then I want to turn around then and reverse the order to 10, 1 so that you can see how you would go about creating a 10 by 1 vector of doubles. So k okay, now, uh, let me go ahead and drop the semicolon temporarily. You'll see now is a column vector. We can do the same thing now with the ones function. But before we look at the help for the ones function, I want you to pay very close attention to this third overload. And this is sort of a common theme, if you would, in MATLAB. You'll see that it has the SZ1 comma dot 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 SZN. And what this simply means is it allows for you to specify the number of elements in each dimension. So for instance, SZ1 is the first dimension, which we typically think of as rows. The second dimension, or SZ2, it helps us to think in terms of columns. And then the third dimension, SZN, or SZ3 rather, I'm sorry, this third dimension we simply think of usually as layers. And we're going to come back to this. And this could continue on as many dimensions as you need to solve the problem. And in this case, then SZN is the nth dimension. Humans generally have a tough time comprehending visually anything beyond four dimensions. And even four is relatively difficult to do. Typically, we assign for that fourth dimension a time. So it's essentially a three-dimensional shape moving through time. <clears throat> now, moving forward, now let's see how the ones function looks. Well, if you pull up the help for the ones function, you'll see that's the exact same pattern. And specifically, this third one's exactly the same. So if you wanted to create a vector for, let's see here, JKL, L could be equal to ones, one comma, 10. And this would simply be a one by 10 vector of ones. And likewise, K then could be a 10, JKLM, sorry, a 10 by one vector of values. 
or a column vac vector of ones. Now, you probably are wondering why are we taking all of this time to talk about zeros and ones? Well, it's useful when we are initializing an array to initialize all of the values to zero and then perhaps be selective about which values we assign to one. And a good example of this would be that we can then use that array to mask off data. So for instance, let's say you have an array of data and you only want to look at a portion of it. We'll see that there is a way to simply specify which indexes you want to look at, but at that point you lose the location information. And so instead what you would want to do is you would want to multiply that original vector or array of data by a vector or array of the same size, but where there are values for zero where you want to mask off or hide the data and a value of one for where you want to keep the data. Now, we'll get an opportunity to take a look at this in more depth in a later video, but that just gives you the principle behind the ones and the zeros. By the way, just so that you know, there are other functions that adhere to this, particularly the true function. So you'll see that there's that same pattern of SZ1 to SZN, and also the false function. And so what you'll see is that oftentimes the true can be used in conjunction with the ones function, and the false can be used in conjunction with the zeros function for much the same reason as I spoke about earlier to mask off information. Now, some additional functions that we might run into or might need to use are going to be the RAND, RAND I, and RAND N. Now, I think it's a bad idea to try to memorize what each one of these functions do. And instead, we want to take advantage of the fact that we have MATLAB in front of us to sort of understand how these functions work. And so we'll start off with RAND, just RAND by itself, and it gives us a uniformly distributed pseudo-random numbers, which quite frankly, doesn't sound all that straightforward. Instead, what we'd like to do is let's go ahead and create a one by 10 vector using the RAND function. So in this case, you'll see that I have values, they're decimal values, and you'll notice that they seem to span somewhere between zero and one, although these seem primarily biased or slightly biased toward uh, values uh, closer to one. That's just by accident. But most importantly, what you don't see are whole numbers and you don't see any negative values. And just to see that that's not a fluke, We'll run this a couple of times, and you'll notice that at no point do I see a negative value. Instead, what I see are values from 0 to 1, and specifically decimal values. All right, so once again, it's kind of an easy way for us to remember what this does just by simply running it. Now. We'll take a look at the RAND I function, which has a slightly different overload. You'll notice that it's similar, but it has an additional value in as the first argument, and that is the I max. And essentially what RAND I does is it allows for you to select a maximum value and then however many values between one and I max that you want. So to begin with here, we'll start off with a M, uh, actually M N O, um, O is equal to Rand I, and we want to specify a I max of 100, and we want to specify one row and 10 columns, and let's see what we get here. So you'll see here that I get values from, uh, assumably starting from one up to a hundred. 
And at this point, though, that's probably too large of a range. I tell you what, why don't we make this more obvious? I'll leave this example here, but let's go ahead and make this a little more obvious. I'm going to pick uh, one to five, and I want to have 10 values. That means I'm guaranteed to get some duplicates, but also that should pretty much expose the entire range here. So you'll see that I get some ones, some twos, all the way up to five. So notice that zero is not included in this one. Okay, so we aren't specifying a zero. Now, likewise, we can, just like the other ones, we can reverse the order of the one and 10. And where we got a, a one by five here, we could also get a five by one, I'm sorry, a one by 10 from one to five. We could just reverse the one and 10 and then get a column vector, a 10 by one column vector. But you'll also notice there is an additional overload down here at the bottom, which we can find useful. And that allows for us to specify both an I min and an I max. So for instance, maybe I was interested in getting integers that spanned from negative five to positive five. And let's say I still wanted 10 of them. Okay, there are other ways for us to go about doing it. This is just a convenience overload. And so you'll see here that I get a five. I don't happen to get a negative five in this one. Um, we'll run this a few times and see if we can't get both. There you go. You'll see I have a couple of three negative fives there and a five. Um, but this basically will give us a one by 10 from negative five to five. All right, so moving on to the next example, that is going to be RAND N. RAND N is kind of interesting and we'll actually get a chance to play around with this uh, later as well. This is a normally distributed random numbers. And the idea is that this is essentially going to form a bell-shaped curve, normal distribution. Um, let's see here. They do not, in fact, have a plot here for it. We'll see how to do that in just a second. But the idea here is with a RAND N is that you get decimal values, not only negative, but uh, not only positive, but also negative. So for instance, in this case, we're going to have RAND N of 1 comma 10. And you'll see that we get both negative and positive values but you'll notice that there doesn't appear to be a clear boundary. In other words, we could have guessed that it might go from negative one to one, but that isn't the case. If you notice, I have a negative 1.79 and I also have a positive 1.7. And we can run this a few times and you'll see that I will get a both higher and lower values. In this case, I'll see a negative 2.138 and so on. Now, what's interesting with the RAND N function is in addition to being pseudo random numbers, it's a normal distribution, which means the more numbers I pick, the more likely it's going to be that I'm going to get a higher and lower value. And so if anything, when we get around to uh, doing some graphing, I'd like to show you what this looks like. Now, there's one additional function that I'd like to throw in here, and this is rand perm. Rand perm is not quite the same as the other random number generators. The big difference with rand perm is it allows for us to create a permutation of a collection of numbers. And so in this particular case, we'll start off M-N-O-P-Q. You got to keep track of my letters here, uh, RAND PERM. And we're going to start off with RAND PERM of 52. Why 52? Well, it just so happens to be that 52 is the number of cards in a deck of cards. So four suits, one through 13, or ace through king. And what you see here in one line is I have effectively shuffled a deck of cards. Now, 
you're probably wondering what is the difference between RAND I and RAND PER. Well, up here in RAND I, I could have also done the same thing. As a matter of fact, I'm simply going to say O is equal to RAND I, and I'm going to specify a maximum value of 52, and I'm actually going to specify 1 by 52, meaning that I want to get 52 values between 1 and 52, including 1 and 52. Now, if I run this one, I seem to get another vector of random integers. However, the difference is, you'll notice I get duplicates with the rand i. There is a 34, there is a 34, there is a 34, and I can almost guarantee there are other duplicates. I see an 11 here, and I also see an 11 here. With rand perm, I get no duplicates. And this is very, very important to notice the difference. So rand perm is very useful when you're wanting to keep shuffle values, but you're wanting to keep each value unique. And then the last way to create a vector is what I refer to as the lazy way. And to do that, you simply specify a index. And we haven't really talked about how to access the values in a vector yet. So this is kind of looking forward to our next video. But let's say I say R parentheses 10. In other words, I have a vector that has nothing in it. There is no R in my workspace. MATLAB will simply let you get away with creating the vector on the fly. So in other words, we have R parentheses 10 is equal to one. Well, what MATLAB does is it lets you create it. It lets you do a lot of things. In this case, it'll let you create a vector where there was no vector and it just attempts to fill the other values in with the default value. So the default data type for numeric is zero. The default value the default numeric data type is double rather, and the default value is zero. You can do this with both vectors and arrays, but we're going to spend more time with arrays later. I'm going to go ahead and stop this video here. I want you to spend some time working with vectors and creating vectors, and in the next video we're going to take a look at how to access vectors. Once again, if you've got any questions or comments, don't hesitate to email me. And thank you for watching.